Um, now, interesting, our topic, you see the questions that, um, that we've asked our, our speakers to talk on, their theme is within you, uh, within you, without you. I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, phrase. You know, it's a, a play on uh, uh, a, a Beatles song from the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club's album, which I'm sure you've heard, hands up who hasn't heard of that. Um, I was interested, I thought, well, what, what on earth is Richard getting at when he asked our speakers to speak on this theme? And uh, I read quite interestingly, at the time, the local press were saying things like, uh, or the, the news, uh, music press were saying, um, it's once a beautiful and severe piece of music, a magnetic sermon about materialism and communal responsibility. And I thought, well, that's very fitting for what we're here to discuss tonight and the situation we're in at the moment. But also there was another bit in uh, brackets afterwards. It, it's about, um, it also added that in a record that was actually devoted to, to gentle technicolour anarchy. Now you can read into that whatever you'd like, but perhaps that suggests we are moving into a, a time and environment where the environment is becoming going to become very, very important in terms of whether we keep it, whether we lose it, whether we save it, whether we care about it and whether we all actually activate ourselves and everybody else on this planet, if I'm sure you want to do so, to actually make sure that our planet continues to survive. It's interesting that Mars is actually on the, in the news today. And yesterday, you see Mars? Once upon a time, it was just like Earth, as one of the suggestions made, and now it's dry and dead. And that was without human intervention. So quite how quickly we'll go red, I do not know, but perhaps we won't. Um, our two speakers this evening... Both have an enviable track record on writing about what nature and culture. Um, our first speaker will be Mark Crocker, who is a UEA graduate. Mark Crocker. Mark Crocker, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> my Tommy was out of room, my own handwriter. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Mark Crocker, um, a UEA graduate um, who writes about the modern responses to the wild. That's what his wiki page says. Whether that's not Place, I'm not sure, I've not read your... No, I have read it, yeah. 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 So I trust you, yeah. yeah. um, He's uh, worked with the BBC, broadcasting with the BBC, writes for newspapers, Guardian Times, written eight, nine books? Ten. Ten books now? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. 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 And you're on your 11th one at the moment, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, passionate about, has travelled the world following nature. I think you're off travelling the world this year as well, later this year. No, well, I only go to Cyprus. Only the other side. <laughs> For people in Norfolk, that's the other side. <laughs> yeah. um, lives in Claxton with his family, and one of your latest books, Claxton Field Notes from a Small Planet, one of your best sellers. So, Mark Cocker, would you like to take the floor for a few or ten minutes? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Can I sit down? Do you want me to stand up to talk? You, you may you sit. Well, the theme that I thought we were speaking on, Richard, was how have we lost touch with nature? Yeah, that's the sort of... The title of the talk is Within You, Without You. Richard playing on the idea that nature is both within us and without us, and, and of course, we are nature. Uh, but I, I'm speaking for... I'm from the Ministry of Doom. <laughs> Richard's from the Ministry of Hope. So I'm going to tell you the problem... Um, and the issues that we face with um, galvanising uh, a response to uh, what some people are calling an age of extinction. But the first um, challenge that I, you know, the first challenge to the proposition that we're losing contact with nature is to uh, reject the notion that the past is a model for what we're seeking to achieve. We're not, we, we, you know, the, the, the assumption is, and of course it is, it is absolutely the case, that um, a Paleolithic community was, at, was completely embedded in nature because culture was so small. A Neolithic society was still fundamentally uh, a transaction between humankind and, and the rest of nature as expressed through species of grass, ungulates like sheep, etc. Um, but the, the idea is that we somehow had a profound and engaging encounter with nature in the past that we must recover is part of a facet of environmentalism which I take deep objection to, which is the, the, the word itself, 
conservation. Because I, I, I see it as really not about the past, but about the future. And the challenge we face is to reach our arms out as wide as possible and husband into the future as much of the rest of the life on the planet. So really, environmental issues are about the future, not about the past. So it's the, the very idea that we're returning to a relationship and a closeness with nature it, it, it is, is, is understandable, but, but those landscapes that we inherited ourselves, that we experienced, Richard, a generation before me, myself from the 70s onwards, um, you know, were an inadvertent consequence of people's discounted valuing of nature. There might have been an abundance of it, but it wasn't because of those people were doing this to the rest of life on the planet. It was just a, an outcome that, that originated from their relationship with nature. And what we have seen is that intensifying indifference, especially as our population has increased, making that crisis of concern for our fellow uh, wildlife or our fellow inhabitants of the planet more acute. So that's the first thing I want to say, that I don't think it's about a return to some utopian romantic past where nature was loved and cherished and the marsh man scything his reeds who loved the gull and the tern and the he ate the tern eggs, he ate the gull, he ate, in fact he ate everything he could lay his hands on and so did his ten children and his wife prepared them. So, so that's the first thing, it's not a return to the past. What we're actually trying to do is inculcate a much more profound ecological imagination, a way of seeing life that doesn't discount it in our economy, that, it, that actually places it as a, as a central part of our entire economic process, and that the economy of the planet and the economy of humankind are somehow fused is, is, is what we are aiming for, and that comes through a concern for nature. The second thing um, I want to say is that um, are we are we are we do we have a diminishing encounter with nature? Are we in a position where nature is becoming less important? And I hope Richard will counter my argument, but I would say that it's but it's. It's simultaneously true that we are losing connection with nature, but also um, increasing. But I think that those two statistics can coexist. And um, to give you uh, an example, there are about 68 million people in this country. There are 6.9 million members of environmental organisations. And I am offering you as a as a straw in the wind, that of that 6.9 million people, which is, a, which is an additive total, it's not a compensatory one, in other words, I just took all the 12 main organisations, added them all up, 4 million of those, of course, of the National Trust. And of, of all environmental organisations, membership of the National Trust is most transactional. It's pursued because you get value for money, as Patrick, will, will Patrick Barker will tell you. Um, so there are 6.8 million of those people. I guess there are 680,000 people, 10% of that total, are doing amazing things. You are all probably, almost certainly, part of that 680,000 people, which is presumably a massive, gargantuan increase in the number of people who had an ecological imagination and took account of nature in, say, the 1970s or the 1950s or the 1930s or 1900. In other words, there is a huge number of people who are gardening for, for pollinators and cycle to work and live in carbon-free houses and are doing and join all those, or represent all those memberships and are doing everything they possibly can, and are part of that community that we see on Twitter or Facebook or in any publication that is about the environment. So that's the second thing. There is a massive increase in caring folk. There is it simultaneously a process of 
of, 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 of indifference and intensifying loss of nature. And by that, and so I reckon 10%, 680,000 people, 1% of the country, and 99% of Britons, 67 million of them, of which a very large percentage are not just losing connection with nature in the way that we care about, which is biodiversity. They're losing connection with something such as a relationship with nature that is to do with patience, that is to do with time, is to do with cyclical encounters with nature, is to do with space. And, and, and so, just to give you one statistical piece of evidence for that, one third of all gardens in London have been destroyed by tarmac, asphalt, uh, you know, pebbles, what are they called? Um, gravel. And worse for me was to see somebody next to my parents' house, and this is anecdotal, and it's just to illuminate this issue of the kind of loss of nature that I'm concerned about. This is not biodiversity. This is, this is an obsession with the rectilinear. And we are surrounded in our urban environment by this intensifying concern for dead things, for deadness, not just for capitalism and all its, and all its byproducts, but for, for a landscape which is, which is made fixed because nature is volatile and unpredictable and dangerous. A lawn has to be cut. A, 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 even a monoculture of ryegrass sprayed with Roundup to kill all the, the other species has to be cut. And therefore, much better to have plastic grass, which is a substitute. And it's that kind of loss of connection with nature, that intensifying concern. There are no straight lines in nature. But our environment is, is completely consumed by not just the rectilinear, but a domestic version of exterior space. So that our gardens look like our interiors. The lawn is a version of the carpet. And another motif, which is drive through southern Lincolnshire, you will find that every hedge is a cypress hedge. And a Lelandi hedge is the natural growing equivalent, equivalent of a brick wall. It's a rectilinear version of something natural. It most approximates to that platonic idea of the straight line, which is devastating nature, which is causing such a systemic loss of connection with what nature it is at its most elemental and philosophical. So I'm not even talking about biodiversity. I'm not even talking about an ecological imagination that concerns itself with husbanding life into the future. It's a loss of connection with the most visceral and intangible part of what a natural system is. And that is profoundly troubling. So I see that at one and the same time, there is a massive increase in people who care and a diminishing receding sense of nature in the lives of so many people. And that is a fundamental challenge to the environmental community. And I have some, because I told you I was from the Ministry of Doom, I have some positive ideas about what could be done differently in the future. But the first positive step I would take as the Jeremy Corbyn leader of the Environmental Norfolk Workers' Party is to dispose of the word conservation. We are not now conserving the past. We are looking to the future, taking with us our arms as wide as possible, as much of life into the future. And we have to find a vocabulary, a jargon that is about... That, that, that rids ourselves of this, of this idea that, you know, the pastoral romantic past is if only we could persuade people we'd return to it. No, we won't. And now just to give you one small example of how you 
reinvigorate your natural environments, you start to break down the rectilinear, the tyranny, the tyranny of straight lines in our domestic environment. Our islands in the middle of our roadways could be small meadows. We need to start producing vast quantities of, of appropriate flowering plants that make nature systemic again in our in our domestic environment. These will be new environments. They're not a return. We're not looking for what environmentalists call a C5 grass bird, you know, <laughs> that kind of crap language that came out of, forgive me, Natural England's or NCC's analysis in the 50s. We just got to make space for something that looks like nature, and that can be done appropriately. So those are just two of my... I could realise I had a whole hour speech for you. But, and there are razor blades for those of you. Can't bear too much longer. But I've just given you two points. We are not returning to the past, and the parts of nature which we are losing are, are, are those intangible, complex... A notions of that you actually can stand and wait and allow a beach hedge to grow instead of having a brick wall lilandi because a lilandi I haven't got time to wait for nature it must do what I want now and that, that notion of dominion is fundamental in western society that's why we're so wealthy but it is also why we have in England a thousand people per square mile probably the most denatured landscape outside of Haiti. Thank you very much. Our next... uh, Richard also has worked with the BBC, with Radio 4, written for The Guardian, The Times. Um, we were discussing earlier, obviously um, Mark is now a Norfolk boy, we were discussing whether you lived in North Suffolk or no. South Norfolk? South Norfolk. South Norfolk. So uh, with that high point and a bonus, would Richard you like to take a minutes? Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm in the slightly embarrassing position of um, agreeing with everything that Mark said. <laughs> <laughs> when, we, when we discuss this subject uh, casually, as we very often do, um, Mark sometimes gives me the impression that he believes there was um, a kind of generation of uh, country people where the children knew the names of flowers and um, went out collecting birds' eggs and whatever. Have I wrong-footed you? <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 can, I, can, I can go in on another tack. Okay. Uh, rather than the same tack as you, but attacking it of an enemy. Right. Um, and of course, as Mark said, this is absolute nonsense. Um, not only in recent time, but as far back as Gilbert White, John Clare, Flora Thompson, three authors of uh, whom I've all written biographical works about, uh, made it absolutely clear that they were regarded as lunatics for having an interest in the natural world and that the country people knew absolutely nothing about it. So Mark's quite right. Forget all that romantic crap about there being a generation that was in harmony with the natural world. It would seem to me that there is equally agree there has never been a generation which was so involved, so informed about the, uh, the natural world as this one. And I agree with him too about um, the existential nature of the perceptions of the world um, that are going wrong for us. Um, and I would extend his notion uh, of that the metaphorical enemy is the rectilinear um, to the conservation movement, um, which I think is rectilinear itself. Um, its obsession with management, its belief in solutions. I'm afraid I heard Richard Powell use the word natural capital, which I will come back to uh, with a degree of venom in a minute, which seems to me um, one of the greatest insults you can give to this astonishing world of 10 million creatures. Um, and I think that maybe um, it's there. Um, it's in the, the tactics, the thinking, the stakeholdering, of the entire conservation movement that's getting in the way of people actually appreciating organisms, because that's what it's all about. Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, I, I wrote a, a book about five years ago 
um, about the beech, the beech tree. I called it in a ghastly pun, which I'm afraid diminished its sales considerably, beech combings. Um, but in it, um, I got to grips with quite a lot um, of the history of forestry um, and went quite deeply into that moment when the plantation was invented. Pretty late in human history, um, I, I owned a community wood, an ancient wood in the Chilterns, for 20 years before I moved up to Norfolk. And the question that people asked was, when was it planted? The idea that trees actually grew of their own accord has been lost from um, the public culture. And conservationists are to blame for that. Um, and you could see um, when John Evelyn published his book Silver, which popularised uh, the idea of tree planting, and almost simultaneously um, German forest science was being invented, and the notion that trees were a kind of arable crop, which you sowed in the ground, um, which you measured the distance between to maximise your output, um, had a profound impact on not just um, the practice of forestry, but on people's grammatical grasp of what the nature of biological growth was. Um, it changed the nature of the verb to grow, most fundamentally. Before 1600, woods grew. Grow was a transit, uh, an intransitive verb. After the plantation system, we grew woods. It became a transitive verb. We were the source of their existence on the planet. Um, they were objects which we created. And indeed, the, the whole kind of uh, sexual innuendos of the tree planting, the insemination of the seed into the ground, um, the careful nurturing of, 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 of the child tree, um, put what Marx called rectilinearity, both literally uh, in the ground plants of the wood, but also in this idea that the growth of nature could be construed simply um, as an, an outgrowth of economics and mathematics. The organisms inside it were lost as things which had um, extraordinary self-willed existences of their own. And I, I would say um, the thing that I would most like to see um, is an end to this, I mean, I know, no, it won't be an end, um, because this is the way it's going to go, the idea of, of, of natural capital. Um, but an equal amount of respect given to the idea that wild organisms have agendas and lives of their own. That is, they are objects, not subjects of our existences. They have agendas of their own lives. Um, they're quite properly called selves. Um, in that they uh, get on with their lives in complex ways which are um, quite different from those in which we try to push them. Um, recently I, I've been writing about the, this in, in connection with plants, the, the independence of plants, and um, there is uh, what is being discovered now about plant intelligence, um, the ability of plants to solve problems, to have long-term memories, to adjust their behaviour according to different challenges, is quite astounding. Um, and it does um, remove plants from the, um, the reification that we've put upon them. Um, at the moment, even though they are the, the basic structure of the entire ecosystem, um, they're basically regarded as furniture. Um, and we don't give them the credit of, of, of being organisms which uh, have, have life plans of their own, which we ought to respect. Um, and I have a feeling, and, and, and it's not simply um, based on my, my philosophy of hope, that, as Mark calls it, but on quite a lot of experience of, of working with kids, um, that it's this that they really respond to. 
the sense of energy and unpredictability and chaos in nature is what turns kids on. Um, two of the greatest sessions I've ever had with kids were, were one where we were working with a, with a very old you. Um, and age was difficult. They were quite young kids, and the idea of trees being 4,000 years old is, is not something they can contain in their um, conceptual arenas. What did amaze them and produce the most astonishing pieces of writing were the central ideas of photosynthesis being a personal thing for them in that space. That is, that that tree was using molecules from their own body to build its wood, and that they also were using molecules from that tree's exhalations to build their own bodies. And that transfixed them um, and produced astonishing pieces of writing. On another course with kids, um, we were using stethoscopes on trees so that they could actually listen to the throb of sap going up through um, the trees, that vital energy. And I think that before we have any hope of, of getting to grips with conservation as international plans and whatever, we need to turn people back on to the fact that these are active, vital fellow organisms we're talking about, whose lives are worth respecting, not just quantifying and planning for. And I think if we, if we do that, and certainly in my experience, when you do that, you get a fantastic feedback, um, then I think we might have a support force um, for what the experts want to do in terms of uh, planning for the future.